All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to Science Diplomacy 2016. My name is Tom Wang. I'm the Chief International Officer here at AAAS, as well as its director for the Center for Science Diplomacy that uh, is hosting this event today. Um, we have a wonderful program today, and actually quite a lot of topics uh, that you all are, are probably more expert on than, than I am, ranging from discussions on COP21 to international data sharing to relationships with Iran and, with, and on the Korean Peninsula to issues of careers and the education in science diplomacy. And this is the second year we've done a conference at AAAS, and you never know how the second one goes, so I'm really happy to see that the auditorium is, is full. And that has a lot to do about what we're trying to do with this conference, which is to build a community of individuals, of professionals, of students interested, participating in, and driving this thing that, we're, that, that we've been calling science diplomacy. And so at the heart of this conference is really you all. So thank you all for, for coming. I think um, first off, this is the first time that our conference really took advantage of the interest in the various topics out in the community. And so we went out to an open call for proposals, didn't know what to expect, and we actually got a tremendous response. And so the majority of our sessions were, are organized and were proposed by uh, some of you here. So uh, thank you for all the organizers, the speakers, uh, for, for doing the heavy lifting, if you will, as, as well as the rapporteurs and all the volunteers and our staff who, who have worked to, to make today, today possible. Um, I'd also, of course, like to acknowledge the financial contributions and, and also the moral support of, of the Richard Lounsbury Foundation and the Golden Family for not only supporting this conference, but of uh, a lot of the work of science diplomacy at, at AAAS. Um, I don't see a couple of individuals that I was going to, to point out, but I thought I, since this is being recorded for posterity and for everybody to see after the fact, I did want to mention uh, two, two individuals, um, one and who will be here hopefully in the next uh, hour or two, um, uh, who have really been true science diplomats. And one is uh, my longtime co-conspirator, Von Tarikian, who's now the s and um, advisor to the Secretary of State and my predecessor in this position who, um, you know, I'd say this is the first year in which we're doing science diplomacy from outside of government and in, and well, outside of government and in, in, in government. So I did want to recognize Von. As well as Kathy Campbell, who, um, Kathy has been the longtime president and CEO of CRDF Global. Um, she's been a science diplomat before the term science diplomacy has been uh, used, used quite ex uh, as, used as, as much as it is now. And um, CRDF Global held a retirement party for her um, last night. And so I certainly wanted to, to, to recognize Kathy. And she and her colleagues have organized a very interesting session on, on Iran um, later today. Um, my job really as the MC is just to keep the ball moving. I'd like to just remind you or, or note a, a couple of organizational things. For those of you active on social media and tweeting, please use the hashtag um, SCIDIP2016, S-C-I-D-I-P 2016. And as I was saying to, to some of you this morning, we'll be making all of the proceedings um, available online um, after the, the conference will be live web streaming some of the sessions that are, are noted in, in the program, but you'll, you know, for, since we have many parallel sessions, um, not, we can't, um, we won't be able to enjoy all of them at the same time. You'll be able to do that after the fact. We're also going to invite all the registrants to join us on, in the science diplomacy group, diplomacy group in, uh, in the AAAS's new Trellis uh, communications and network platform where you can continue discussions and also access a lot of these resources that will be available from the conference. Um, 
Finally, and, and just as importantly, I think you've already noticed that we have uh, posters throughout the first and second floors of, of the conference uh, center here. And um, they'll be up all day, but the uh, poster presenters will actually be standing next to our posters, talking about their posters um, at, at our closing evening reception. So I hope you stay around all day, but if you can't, please stop by and look during the coffee breaks um, because they, they cover quite a interesting and important array of science diplomacy topics that we couldn't fit all in into formal sessions. Um, and then finally, I'd like to just turn the podium over to the CEO of AAAS and executive publisher of the Science Family of Journals, Dr. Rush Holt. Thank you, Tom. Oh, you, fo you folks look great this morning. It, is, uh, it really is good to see you here. I'm Rush Holt. I'm the CEO of the AAAS, where you are, uh, and uh, executive publisher of the Science Family of Journals. And uh, we're, we're pleased to be uh, uh, among the foremost promoters of the idea of science and diplomacy. Uh, science and diplomacy, uh, as, as a union is, is not new. Uh, science for diplomacy, diplomacy for science, uh, you know, goes far back, uh, even into history. Uh, but science and diplomacy uh, as, a, as a discipline, as a study, as a, uh, an idea to promulgate in countries and relationships between countries around the world, um, it is still not uh, as fully established uh, as, uh, as they should be. Uh, and uh, uh, we uh, work with Science and Diplomacy Journal, uh, Bill Coldglazer, the editor, I think I saw him here. There's Bill. Uh, and of course, Vaughn and, uh, uh, has carried this uh, uh, to the, to the State Department, having left here a year ago. And Tom is among the world's foremost uh, proponents of this. In fact, we all have a, a, a zeal like new converts uh, to the idea of, uh, of science and diplomacy. And uh, this second conference uh, is uh, not, not only full of good programs, but uh, symbolically important in, in uh, establishing this science and diplomacy as an ongoing uh, area of study and discussion. So uh, we're uh, delighted to see so many people here. I'm delighted to see such a good program. Um, the, uh, since last year's conference, the importance of science diplomacy has only strengthened and international scientific collaboration uh, as as you folks know, is uh, critical for advancing science and innovation, but it's also important uh, to bring science to diplomacy and to tackling, uh, and, uh, uh, tackling the world's uh, challenges. Um, even as the Ebola epidemic in West Africa and MERS in the Arabian Peninsula uh, have waned, the spread of Zika virus in the Americas underscores the importance of efforts by governments and scientists to, uh, to cooperate on monitoring and on medical interventions uh, on the advancement of research. Uh, President Obama's historic visit to Cuba just a couple of months ago highlighted important changes that have occurred over the past year uh, over the past year to normalize relations between the United States and Cuba. And these changes from relaxation of restrictions on travel and organizing scientific conferences to permitting Cuban nationals to receive educational grants and scholarships uh, are already benefiting both scientific communities and enabling them to cooperate on such things as Zika, on ocean studies, on uh, fishing and uh, uh, other studies. Um, and it's good to remember that even during the most difficult times in the U.S.-Cuba relationship, scientists here and there 
and together uh, worked to keep alive partnerships that go back uh, more than a century. AAAS itself has engaged with scientific counterparts and participated in five science diplomacy trips to Cuba uh, over the last, uh, well, couple of decades. And uh, the, um, uh, well, it's not always been easy, uh, but the nurturing of the ties really has paid off. Uh, since the establishment of diplomatic relations, new opportunities for research co cooperation have opened up uh, well, blindingly fast uh, in biomedical sciences, in uh, public health, in agriculture, in ocean science, in conservation. And the successes, uh, starting with uh, discoveries about yellow fever uh, a century ago, more than a century ago, to current research on chikungunya and, and any number of other things are, uh, are, are a tradition that will clearly extend and grow stronger. Uh, at AAAS, through an agreement with the Cuban Academy of Sciences, uh, we're, we're working to build scientific relationships and to catalyze research collaborations. The MOU signed with the Academy in, uh, two years ago focuses on infectious diseases, cancer, resistance to antimicrobial drugs, and neurological and neurodegenerative diseases. Last December, we organized a U.S. neuroscience delegation to Havana to discuss uh, strategic uh, areas of cooperation like neuroinformatics. In a few weeks, uh, we'll be organize a organizing a symposium on cancer control with the Center for Molecular Immunology in Havana. And later this year, we'll be launching a new Cuba Biomedical Research Fellows Program, which will place early to mid-career Cuban scientists in US laboratories for short visits, thanks to generous support from the Lounsbury Foundation. Uh, I, I talk about Cuba, uh, not because it's the only place where this is happening, but it, it is, a, is such a good example of how the common language of science, the interest of scientists, the ability of scientists to get past uh, uh, some political impediments uh, speaks well for science diplomacy uh, in many places around the world. Science and diplomacy um, is, uh, well, let's take Japan. Last uh, September, Japan created its first ever science advisor position in the foreign ministry. Foreign Minister Kishida appointed uh, Terry Okishi, former president of the University of Tokyo, a material scientist, as his science and technology advisor. In December, Minister Kishida also established a new science and technology diplomacy advi advisory network. Following a, the, I think it was 16 point uh, proposal of, uh, uh, that was uh, presented to the uh, Japanese government on ways to bring science more into uh, foreign affairs and uh, 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 international relations. Scientists, engineers, and other technical experts uh, work with diplomats and policymakers at the international level uh, in many countries. The Sustainable Development Goals uh, 2030, which was adopted by the UN General Assembly last September, uh, also speaks to science. Um, the 17 goals can, can be reached only with contributions from science uh, and science and technology. And whether it's the development, development of more sustainable agriculture and energy technologies or improved scientifically informed policies for managing forests and oceans. Uh, the science uh, development goals uh, fit very much with our theme of science and diplomacy. Uh, Bill Colglazer, whom I referred to before as the editor of Science and Diplomacy, is on the International Science Advisory Council uh, for these sustainable development goals. Uh, one of the development goals is an urgent action to combat climate change. The Paris Accords in December at COP21, uh, signed formally a couple of weeks ago, is an important achievement, a very important achievement. 
launched, uh, and uh, at the same time, there was launched a, uh, an agreement among more than 20 countries, uh, 20 and growing, uh, that are banding together to expand investment and cooperation in energy research and development. To address challenges like climate change through a globalized scientific community, um, I emphasized here at this podium with you a year ago that there needs to be organized support for emerging scientific communities and countries investing in science and working to build indigenous scientific capacity. Uh, I've long argued, and some of you have worked hard on the idea that the best aid that one country can give to another is to develop the indigenous scientific capacity. More scientists really need to be brought uh, into international discussions, and we can help, and you can help do that. At AAAS, we've undertaken a project building on our decades-long effort with the s and Policy Fellowships to bridge scientific and policy communities, to better inform and enable scientists in countries around the world, to build mechanisms that connect policy, the policy-making process. Uh, for 45 years now, we here in the United States, from AAAS, have placed, uh, well, this year, 280 PhD-level scientists in various places in the legislative, judicial, and executive branches uh, of our government. Um, other countries are starting to think about that. Um, we have uh, more than three dozen fellows in the State Department. We have more than 40 fellows at USAID. Um, these uh, are practitioners of science and diplomacy. Finally, nuclear security continues to be one of the critical global challenges we face highlighted by the Nuclear Security Summit here last month, here in Washington. Cooperation between the United States and the Soviet Union on nuclear, nuclear, nuclear arms control was an exemplar of science diplomacy during the Cold War. Scientists were able to do things that the political diplomats were not. Ultimately, uh, it made a difference. Today, global cooperation on issues like mitigating nuclear terrorism requires scientific and technological innovation and participation of academic and private sectors, as well as government. So I'm delighted that uh, Under Secretary Rose Gottmuller is here with us and will address us shortly. So I've just touched on a few examples. Um, you know, for years, science and diplomacy have been an important union of ideas, of activities. Um, it's coming into its own, and uh, that union, and uh, we want to promote it much, much more. We'll have a number of in-depth discussions today uh, on, uh, I think, many outstanding sessions. And uh, the participants, if you look at the, uh, where you all come from, uh, you're in a position to carry the ideas, the learning, the sharing that comes out of today's meetings uh, back to your agencies, to your organizations, to your institutions, and put them into practice. Thanks very much for coming. Thank you, Rush. And I am going to be delighted to uh, introduce shortly our keynote speaker as soon as I stop this from playing <laughs> continuously. Okay, hopefully that does it. Um, I'm delighted. Oh. <laughs> that looks good, doesn't it? <laughs> um, I won't spend too much time on this and use anybody's time, but um, maybe I'll just leave this up. So, 
I'm delighted to introduce Under Secretary of State Rose Gottmuller. Uh, she is the Under Secretary for Arms Control and International Security and has had uh, numerous senior positions uh, both in the State Department um, and previously at the um, Department of, of, of Energy. And I won't go into all of those because you have her bio in front of you. Um, did want to emphasize her key role as the chief negotiator, U.S. negotiator of the new uh, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, the New Start with the Russian Federation, which entered in force in 2011. Uh, she's also been outside of government, held senior positions at the Carnegie Endowment uh, for International Peace, um, as well as at, at the RAND Corporation, and she also served time in the National Security Council. Um, can I say that uh, Under Secretary Gartmuller is a local. I mean, she <laughs> attended both uh, Georgetown and George Washington universities. And please um, uh, help me um, well, uh, welcome Undersecretary Gottmuller to give the keynote address to the conference. Thank you very much, Tom. That's a very apt comment, actually serving time on the National Security Council <laughs> staff. It does feel a bit like a prison sentence when you're there, but uh, no, I, I take that back. Um, thank you, Tom. Thank you for that, that very uh, warm introduction, and also thank you, a big thank you to Rush Holt for inviting me here today. Uh, you know, the AAAS is the very embodiment of science in diplomacy and diplomacy in science. I was reminded of that looking at the slides flipping over. Science and Diplomacy Magazine is actually a favorite reading material around our house, so uh, I commend it to you if you haven't had a chance to look at it yet. Um, I was asked to give my view today on the role that science and scientists play in international relations, especially as it relates to my sphere of work disarmament, arms control, nonproliferation. And I am delighted to have this opportunity because there is no better place to make my appeal to you to help you to help me with my special problems. So what are my special problems? As you're aware if you've been working in the disarmament field for some time, the tradition began in the 1970s of monitoring and verification to ensure that arms control treaties and agreements are being properly implemented. Actually, I time the launch of on-site inspection to the Antarctic Treaty, which was negotiated in the late 1950s. At the time, many people don't know that the Antarctic Treaty was originally an arms control treaty because we were concerned that the Soviets were going to put ICBMs in Antarctica and get us from behind, so to say and they had concerns about militarization also taking place. So the Antarctic Treaty became also, in addition to what it is today, a very powerful international legal platform to support science cooperation, environmental cooperation. It also began its life as a disarmament treaty with on-site inspection as part of the Antarctic Treaty's implementation um, mechanism. So fast forward to the 1970s and our first negotiations uh, with the Soviets at that time, the SALT I agreement, and we agreed we would not interfere with each other's national technical means. National technical means, large satellites, high-flying aircraft, over-the-horizon radar capabilities. We would not interfere with national technical means that could be used to monitor large objects, ICBMs in their silos, bombers at their bases, submarines sitting at wharfside in their ports. Large objects, we were focused on the delivery vehicles because we said if we can monitor the status of the delivery vehicles, we will be monitoring the status of the warheads. That's all we needed to know at that point. As time has gone on, though, our monitoring and verification problems have become more difficult. We realized by the end of the 1970s that we needed on-site inspection in the nuclear disarmament realm as well. It was first incorporated into the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty and now is an old standby. It's an important and very valuable aspect of the New START Treaty. But our problems are moving now from monitoring and verifying large objects, delivery vehicles, 
to monitoring and verifying small objects, warheads. Warheads even held in storage facilities. Warheads not mated to their missile systems. Small objects, that's one of my special problems. How do we monitor and verify small objects? The second of my problems is how do we monitor processes? Processes. And a perfect example of that is what was agreed in the JCPOA, the recent agreement with Iran, uh, having to do with monitoring their enrichment of uranium going forward to ensure it doesn't pass the threshold into high enrichment. That was a core aspect of the JCPOA. But monitoring enrichment processes is a challenge. It is a challenge to my community and one that, again, I look to your community to help us with. I'm going to return to the Iran deal and that process monitoring in a moment, but let me move on to talk a bit about how I've been looking at this problem over the last couple of years. The last time I stood on this podium, I had the opportunity to speak about my interest in the products of the information technology revolution and how they can help us with these two special problems of monitoring small objects and monitoring process. I've been thinking about this and speaking about it. Some of you may have heard me speak about the ways that we can use ubiquitous sensing to help us with these particular problems. Already, there are in place, and many of you no doubt have one on your iPhone, radiation detection systems, monitors, can be downloaded as an app to iPhones already being used around the Fukushima power plant site in Japan by local population to monitor radiation levels there, feeding into a centralized database and helping to enhance the both local knowledge, domestic knowledge, but also the national knowledge and uh, ultimately international scientific knowledge about what's going on at Fukushima. So that's one example of a sensor system on a dispersed mobile platform already being used in practical ways. Another event, uh, another uh, example that I brought up when I was here last time is the fact that all, um, you know, iPads, all uh, uh, mobile platforms of that kind have accelerometers in them. They, of course, are used to tell this, the, the device which side is up and which side needs to be facing the reader, but they also tell you if there's a seismic event around. And you can imagine, as I said last time I was here, a whole network of such iPad accelerometers somehow linked together and providing data for earthquake detection but they could also be used, potentially, to monitor for illicit nuclear tests. Of course, you have to have additional analysis to distinguish between a naturally occurring event like an earthquake and an illicit nuclear test. But those are some of the areas that we've been looking at and considering as potentially interesting for helping us with our arms control monitoring problems. I have thought about it in two ways. One is help with the inspection problem per se, how do we get more and better data to help us to identify small objects, to count, and to characterize them, to monitor processes and to characterize them. So that's one side of it, data for monitoring purposes. But the other side is very bread and butter, tools for inspectors. I often like to tell the story of uh, the early days of on-site inspection and how in those days, out in snowy Siberia, our inspectors had to know how to ski. They had to know about cross-country skiing because in order to ensure that there weren't other gates around a facility where missiles could be coming and going, they would ski the perimeter and just check to make sure that there were no other open gates. And then they'd proceed with their inspection. Well, you can imagine how time-consuming that was. They all had to be in really good shape, though. And uh, I've heard many stories from these guys and gals, because some of them were women, and pretty short women, but they sure knew how to ski. Anyway, long story short, you can imagine a tool for an inspector that makes use of you know, some quite simple and now well-known software, such as Google Earth, to give a picture of a perimeter fence and help in real time an inspector to understand that there are no additional gaps in that perimeter fence, no need to worry about missiles coming and going during an inspection process, already a tool that helps the inspector to cut down on the amount of time he has to be at a site and to make his inspection 
more efficient. So that's just one example, but it's another area that I've been thinking about, again, in a very kind of bread and butter practical way, would be very helpful to our world. There has been, as I've carried this discussion forward, a big debate about societal verification and the problems of identification of individuals in arms control verification. And of course, one can imagine that the Russians or the Chinese would not want their public involved in helping to track what's happening with their mobile ICBMs, for example. No, this is a no-brainer. I take the criticism, I understand it, and we have to wrestle with both the, well, we have to wrestle with the diplomatic aspects of this, the negotiability questions, would any of this be negotiable, but that's my problem, that's not your problem. <laughs> but we also have to then deal with the issues of privacy, issues of legality and so forth, and I recognize and grant that, but I would just, at the moment, like to concentrate on and think about the applicability of these promising technologies, ubiquitous sensing technologies, particularly to the arms control and non-proliferation verification task. I think in terms of uh, problems with identification of individuals, I can imagine a scenario where a country wanting to convey to the entire international community that it is complying with a total ban might pull its citizens in and say, can you help us to establish our bona fides in the international community, for example, that we are completely in compliance with the Chemical Weapons Convention, which is a total ban on the possession, production, deployment, et cetera, of chemical weapons. So a total ban, I can imagine a government wanting its citizens to join in a societal verification effort to prove to the international community its compliance with that ban. But that's the only example I can think of. Otherwise, we do have to concern ourselves and consider anonymization of data, and I know this is for any number of reasons uh, related to the privacy debate overall, but it is uh, uh, also a topic that's being taken up by uh, the scientific community and the IT community. Very, very important set of questions and well worth, uh, I think, again, bringing into this discourse about how such tools might be developed for arms control and nonproliferation purposes. The last thing I'll say about this uh, as we consider it, these kinds of uh, <coughs> approaches have been a no-brainer for the environmental community for a very long time. A crude example that I like to cite is the Gulf oil spill already some years ago now, where local community activists got together with the local population down on the beaches of Texas, of Galveston, in that area, and ask people to begin taking pictures and sending them into a central database to help the local environmentalists to scope the extent of the oil spill and the damage to Texas beaches. This is, this is an example that's all over the place. The environmental community is doing this quite broadly. And at the strategic level, in implementation and working out implementation of the Paris Climate Agreement, these kinds of approaches to monitoring carbon emissions are being considered, many of them big data approaches, I'll come to that in a moment, but also involving uh, internationally uh, the public in <coughs> monitoring and verification. So I, I just want to make that point. On the environmental side, it's been pretty much a no-brainer. The Chinese didn't like it a couple years ago when we put a pollution monitor on the rooftop of our embassy and started putting the data out on the embassy website every day. But eventually they decided they might as well go along to get along, <laughs> I guess, but began joining in themselves in putting out more accurate environmental data about what's going on in Beijing with the pollution. And in fact, Xi Jinping and the Chinese government have been right at the center of uh, leading uh, the Paris Climate Accord efforts, and uh, that's been a very important step forward. It's, you know, for the national interest and economic health of that country. Of course, countries only join in when it's in their national interest to do so, but I think the case has now been made. Um, so leaving that topic, I wanted to expand the discussion today into another area that is, has been taking shape for some time, but I know uh, is, again, not something that has been thought about in the realm of arms control, nonproliferation, verification, and monitoring. And that 
is the industrial internet of things. My eye was caught a couple of weeks ago by a very good article in the Financial Times, a report of Satya Nadella's visit to uh, the Hamburg Fair to talk about Microsoft's interest in utilizing core data being thrown off by machinery to improve efficiency, safety, shareability, interactivity, performance, you name it. Of course, this is an area that's taking shape. There's a competition taking shape in the IT community about who's going to be the winner. The article also mentioned Westinghouse is uh, playing and playing hard in this arena. But uh, I was attracted to it because of the way you could use data from industrial facilities, of course adding in data from external uh, sources to optimize a task, to optimize performance. I liked the example very, very much from the article of combining data from an individual aircraft's performance, including its engine efficiency, with weather data along its expected flight plan in order to tweak the individual aircraft's performance to enhance efficiency, but also to send it on the route that might avoid some of the more uh, difficult weather patterns to go through. So those are examples, I think, that are extremely interesting about combining external data with internal data to um, make a task more efficient. So how could this apply to the arms control and nonproliferation space? I wanted to bring us back again to the Iran nuclear deal. The Iran nuclear deal it contains a very important innovation that is monitoring of the process of enrichment in Iran, again, to make sure that the Iranians do not move again into the realm of producing high enriched uranium. It is at the heart of the efficacy of the JCPOA and extraordinarily, extraordinarily important to its long-term success over 10 to 15 years. This is an innovative approach, but it is not the first time it has been tried. And I wanted to let you know that the roots of this effort are back in the monitoring regime that was put in place for the so-called um, HEU purchase agreement. We uh, put in place at the enrichment facilities in Russia, actually hardware on the enrichment lines to monitor the level of enrichment. This was a transparency, this was a transparency measure different from monitoring and verifying agreement, uh, an agreement, because when you're verifying an agreement, there's an obligation in the agreement, and you're monitoring to ensure that they are reaching uh, and implementing their obligation. A transparency measure, as it was in the HEU purchase agreement, was just to make sure that the quality of the enriched uranium was at a certain level. And so in that way, from time to time, we would have our experts go in and read the data. But it was the fact that early on and beginning in the 1990s, we were beginning to monitor enrichment with the cooperation working together with the Russians at several enrichment facilities in Russia. So this threshold has been stepped over. Now how do we make it more efficient and effective? And the industrial internet of things, I think, is a way very seriously to go about it. I can envision and I'm going to wrap up here and move to our discussion. But I can envision two ways, particularly, that the industrial internet of things could help with the problems that I have. First of all, so-called safeguards by design. In the safeguards agreements, uh, we have long had uh, ways to work with countries to ensure they have access to facilities, to ensure inspectors can go in. The notion of safeguards by design is that when a new facility is being built, you build it to optimize the efficiency of safeguards activities to ensure that inspectors have easy access to what they need to see, to ensure that there are certain 
uh, monitoring capabilities, CCTV cameras as a simple example, are built in to ensure that uh, there are you know, no hidden nooks and crannies that would arouse questions over many, many years of the, uh, of the uh, performance of a facility in a safeguards regime. So safeguards by design, I can imagine that would be a very relevant area to look at this applicability of uh, big data of the industrial internet of things to the non-proliferation safeguards problem. The other is related. Uh, and again, I welcome from this audience perhaps some additional ideas, but the other is also related to uh, the civil nuclear power uh, issue going forward and the insurance that a civil nuclear power program does not bleed over into a weapons program. And of course, they are uh, of necessity Siamese twins. They are joined together. But we have to look for ways, and, and the community has always been looking for ways to introduce a separation. One way is proliferation resistance in reactor design. And here again, the applicability of the industrial internet of things and big data could be uh, a way to enhance our ability to design nuclear reactors that are resistant to proliferation while optimized for the production of energy. And perhaps optimized also for the minimization of waste. Many, many opportunities and ideas out there. So thank you very much for your attention this morning. I look forward very, very much to our discussion. I am quite serious about uh, working with the scientific community on these important problems and have uh, spoken recently in Silicon Valley. We had a very interesting workshop back uh, in the first week of April drawing together Silicon Valley companies as well as academic players. It was held at Stanford University. Very, very interesting discussions focused on this set of issues. If you are interested, because that group that formed as a result of that workshop is continuing to look for practical ways to, to bring these kinds of ideas into implementation and monitoring of arms control treaties and agreements. So if you are interested in joining this, uh, please be in touch and we will definitely look for ways to link you up with the community out at Stanford and in Silicon Valley because there are a lot of people thinking about this, a lot of people thinking about it in our national laboratories as well. I see a couple of laboratory colleagues around the audience and there's some very good work going on already, but I welcome widening of the circle and I've been very keen to have both the larger academic community here in the United States, but also the larger international community involved in this effort. So I welcome uh, your comments, I welcome your questions, and uh, I regret to say I am going to have to leave uh, pretty smartly at 10 o'clock, but I think we have about 10 minutes for questions. So thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Um, as the Under Secretary mentioned, she's uh, happy to take a few questions uh, in the moments remaining. There are two microphones, one on each aisle, so please, uh, if you have questions, uh, line up and you know, you, uh, say your name and affiliation and, and please keep it to a question, so please, please do that. But, uh, oh, I don't mind comments, too. And, like, uh, and comments? Okay, yeah, as comments long as are it's, fine. And new ideas. And comments, anyway. <laughs> so please, uh, please use the use the microphones. Um, as sort of the MC, I did have a sort of start start the ball ball rolling. Is you sort of I'm glad you mentioned the Silicon Valley meeting uh, that, that you were at a couple weeks ago. Um, and one of the questions is, how do you get either the information or the technologies into the state into your, your bureaus, into the IAEA, how do you get the knowledge and people, the expertise in there to, yeah. to, to do that? Yeah, that's a very, very good question, Tom. And actually, I am very glad you raised it because I uh, forgot to mention, Rush Holt was talking about the AAAS fellows and the role uh, that they play in the Department of State and AID. I am always delighted to see AAAS fellows walk through the door because they are always uh, value added in terms of the work we do and bring particular perspectives to bear. So one thing is to do more of what you're doing, <laughs> to continue the fellows program and uh, send them knocking uh, to my door, to the T family, 
Uh, people wonder, they ask about what does T stand for? Um, that's, you know, it's called the T family, my, my three bureaus, arms control, nonproliferation, and political military affairs. Well, I like to think it stands for technology, but somebody told me it's actually the, uh, the first initial of the first guy who held this position way back in the 70s. <laughs> Maybe his name was Tom, I don't know. But anyway, uh, uh, I am uh, very much welcoming in my own, uh, in my own uh, family of bureaus working with, with AAAS fellows and fellows from, from other places as well. Second thing is we are doing everything we can to facilitate the entry of uh, younger uh, scientists and technical experts, uh, as well as, of course, our very experienced senior hands, uh, of which we have many, but they are now preparing for retirement, and I'm facing basically a mass retirement, so we are looking for ways to bring uh, our, our next generation of uh, technical experts into the T family, and I'm very glad that we have been able to take steps in this administration, which I plan to cement in every way I can, to bro more broadly use the authorities that are available to me and to my assistant secretaries to, uh, to hire younger people. So there's no question that we need to uh, effect that evolution, but it is uh, a very, very important aspect of what I want to accomplish between now and the end of 2016. Thanks. Please, go ahead. Hi, I'm Leslie Martinich, I'm with IEEE, and uh, I'm a former fellow from IEEE. I worked Yay. as a fellow in, in 2012, and I really enjoyed that experience. I wonder, uh, we have members all over the world, but we have a particular interest in Internet of Things, and I want, you mentioned stay in touch to find out more how to be engaged. I would like to get our members engaged Great. with this program. How can I do that? Um, you can do it by talking to my colleague, Alex Bell, who's right here in the first yeah, row. <laughs> and uh, I'm a terrible bureaucrat. I don't have any business cards with me, but Alex will definitely... I'm a terrible engineer. I don't have any business cards <laughs> with me. But Alex will, will link us up, and I'd be delighted to talk about how we could do that because I, I have a great respect for IEEE. Awesome. Thank, Thank you. you. Please. Hi, my name's Beth Zittler, and I'm a AAAS fellow uh, with the Millennium Challenge Corporation. So I'm a chemist working in uh, U.S. Foreign Assistance. Great. And what I'm curious uh, to hear more about, you mentioned that the environmental community does a really good job right now um, using remote sensing. And I think that one of the reasons for that is just the nature of environmental problems require this kind of massive amounts of data. But um, they're also really good at forming coalitions. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit um, from your perspective, either high level coalitions, which I'm sure is mm -hmm. a lot of what you do, but if you have any experience also on community level coalitions related to some of the problems you're facing, if you could talk yeah, about that. Yeah, very, very good question. Um, and I'll come to that in a moment, but just to stress that um, I didn't only want to, um, to point to the remote sensing work that the environmental community has been doing, which is indeed very, very important and very, very good, but they've also begun to step over into the enforcement realm now. And I'm thinking about uh, enforcement of wildlife trafficking, for example. We are about at the State Department in September to have another oceans conference, the Our Oceans Conference. And there's a, a big uh, program internationally called Sea Scout to track and bring to justice Ill illicit fishing, you know, illicit fishermen. And uh, that makes use of various parts and pieces, uh, again, of the IT revolution, but also means countries have to be willing to come in and, and partner as well. And so uh, they, are, they are doing remote sensing, but they are also on the enforcement piece, which is what is important for me, because as the president likes to say, uh, treaties have to mean something. You have to be able to enforce compliance on a, in a treaty. Uh, so. Uh, that's uh, why I'm interested in it in the arms control and nonproliferation uh, realm. But uh, as to your question, yes, I've uh, contemplated this for many, many years, and it is a fact that uh, nonproliferation and uh, arms control treaties and agreements have been the realm historically of governments more uh, than involving the NGO community, and it's quite different on the environmental side. I recognize that uh, the NGO community is uh, very involved uh, in uh, diplomacy, very involved in bringing about treaties and agreements, and very good in that way, coming together and forming, forming coalitions and forming groups. It's difficult in the arms control realm, again, because of the classification, you know, 
The Russians may talk to us about uh, you know details of their ICBM systems, but they probably wouldn't want that you know to be in part of a, an unclassified discussion. And we would feel the same way. So there is that limitation there. But nevertheless, I think we could be doing more. We have a very uh, articulate, a very enthusiastic NGO community in the arms control uh, arena. Um, I would say that uh, I'd like to look for, for more partnership on practical measures, pragmatic action that we can take. Uh, sometimes they're heading off in a different direction and one that we're not thinking is particularly pragmatic uh, and practical, but that's a diplomatic comment. <laughs> so thank you, good, good question. Well, Looks please like uh, join me in, in thanking Under Secretary Gottmuller again for her. Thank you. Thank you again very, very much. And uh, again, if you would like to be in touch with us, uh, Alex Bell, her email address is easy to remember. I'm going to hand it out, Alex. It's uh, Bell A. Uh, B-E-L-L-A at state.gov. So very easy to find her on our, uh, on our email server. So thank you again very much.